McGregor welcome you to a place where all kinds of phenomena flourish. Here, voices whisper ancient secrets, signs and symbols are abundant. UFOs, ETs, ghosts, and even the dead move about freely. Pilots fly into the Bermuda Triangle and live to tell about it. Dreams and visions of future events come true. Mind-to-mind communication is the norm. Here, we meet authors, researchers, and investigators of the mysterious, the strange, and of the inexplicable anomalies that surround us. Step out of the everyday world and take a journey into the mystical underground. This is Rob McGregor and Trish McGregor, along with John Posey, our tech magician. We're entering the mystical underground on 2202, and it's our second episode. That's five twos. Oh, so thank two, you. 22020. 22020. You said 02. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, behind 18 years. <laughs> Okay, thank you for joining us on this strange journey. The mystical underground is a place where the weird and wonderful flourish, where ideas that don't quite fit the mainstream materialistic science world are explored, and the mundane, everyday world takes a back seat, a back seat to a greater reality in which we are not physical beings seeking a spiritual experience, but at our essence are spiritual beings experiencing a physical reality and making use of it, use of its limitations to advance our spiritual quest. Okay, it's just uh, many of us have forgotten our origins because the physical world drapes us in amnesia, making it a challenge to recognize our true selves exist outside of time and space and physical reality. Okay, here's a story from the mystical underground, and this is the kind of thing you find here. On August 12, 2015, Rob and I heard that Whitley Strieber's wife, Anne, had passed away the day before. Now, we had known her since we'd first appeared on Whitley's podcast, Dreamland. And so I went to my computer to email Whitley that we just heard the news. As I was writing, if there's anything we can do, please let us know. As soon as I typed that word, something happened. There was a tremendous flash of light and explosion in our family room. It was like a transformer blowing up. The uh, family room is probably six steps from our offices. So I leaped up expecting to find the television in pieces or maybe the air conditioning had blown up or the stove or something. But the only thing I saw was our golden retriever, retriever Noah, who was startled out of a nap by the explosion. And he had bolted off the couch. So that's we knew it wasn't imaginary. So we went outside to check the, the transformer across the street, went through the house. Nothing had happened. And then I remember that I was, as I was writing Whitley about Anne and, and the explosion that happened, I typed the word no. Now, then I thought, okay, is this spirit contact? And I wrote Whitley about what had just happened. I felt it was Anne already stirring things up on the other side. And he quickly replied, she sure as hell is. She's here. You better believe it. So hearing sounds, voices, things that, that other people don't normally hear is a chapter in our most recent book, Phenomena, Harnessing Your Psychic Powers. So that was an anecdote, a story, and we have lots of stories in our book. Um, Here's from the back cover of the book. As humanity's collective consciousness evolves and expands, more of us are experiencing phenomena, voices no one else hears, visions no one else sees, intuitive feelings that presage the future. Some of us communicate with the dead, see interdimensional beings, and claim to have been abducted by aliens. And some of us experience synchronicities, meaningful coincidences, that is, that defy the odds. So Trish and I probably wouldn't write about this stuff if some of it didn't happen to us. So Trish mentioned the explosion in our house uh, that had no visible source. But we have another story that uh, is in our latest book, uh, Phenomena. Uh, And this is about uh, also about a mystical sound. So this was a number of years ago. We took a trip uh, to, to the Dominican Republic, and it was a, a windsurfing trip uh, 
uh, went with our daughter. Did you go windsurfing, Trish? No, I didn't. I went shopping. <laughs> okay, was, Megan and I were the windsurfers. And we found a place on the internet that looked really cool, a hotel on the beach. And it had this courtyard uh, between the buildings and, and the ocean on the other side. And we got this room on back facing the ocean with a courtyard in front of us. And we, when we got there, the courtyard was a cemetery. Uh, and with a gator, with a fence and gate around it. And so that, that was odd. So uh, one day the gate was open. And uh, so we went down, Trish and I went and w- walked inside. And then we saw the grave digger. He came up to us and he was digging away in the back, he said. And he, he, he mentioned that the sand keeps coming in here on the Dominican Republic and, and the, the beach rises up where in Florida we keep losing the sand and have to import sand. So what happens is there's some, uh, there's uh, graveyards on top of graveyards and he was digging a grave to uh, apparently bury somebody and uh, there he hit another lower lower graveyard. He wanted to show us this old uh, uh, coffin, I guess, and we said, no, nah, that's all right. But we noticed that just inside the gate, there was, uh, we thought this was kind of an ancient cemetery, but just inside the gate, there was a, a grave that was only four months old, and it was a windsurfer who had apparently died, and he used uh, half of it, uh, somebody used half of his board as his gravestone. Uh, so that, that was kind of surprising. That was right uh, near our door. And our, so our, Rob picks up a stone from the cemetery. Right. Big mistake. I, pick, I pick up this stone, put it in my pocket. I don't know why I did that. But <laughs> by that time, our daughter, who was Megan was 12 or 13 at the time, and she was saying, I don't want to stay in this room looking at this graveyard all the time. And so we talked to the management, and there was another building on the side that uh, was closer to the ocean, and the front of it looked right out onto the beach. And so they were uh, able to transfer us to uh, a room there. In fact, we're the only ones in that whole building. And um, the only thing is that the the entrance on the side was actually closer to the graveyard than we had been before. But anyhow, so our first night there, uh, we went to bed kind of early, about 11, 11.30. Megan was already asleep in the back of the uh, uh, apartment. apartment. And... Trish and I went to sleep and I'd been asleep maybe 10, 15 minutes when I heard what sounded like a wrecking ball hitting the side of the building. Boom, boom, boom. There was a pause. Boom, boom, boom. We heard it three times. So the third time I sat up and Trish, who had also been asleep, sat up simultaneously. We look at each other and I said, did you hear that? And we both heard this strange uh, sound. It, it's, it sounded like the whole building was shuddering from the, this. And uh, we thought maybe there uh, was an earthquake or something. We didn't <laughs> know. And then the television came on. We hadn't even been watching television. It was very strange. And uh, But the thing is, there, it wasn't a scary sensation. It, it, was, was, it was very energizing. Yeah. It, it was something deep and energetic that was coming to us. And uh, you know, and then in the morning we talked to the management and the manager, and we said uh, we think one of the, the ghosts were uh, <laughs> visiting us, and they said, "Oh yeah, but they're friendly ghosts here." <laughs> and, well, Rob took that stone and tossed it back yeah, in the cemetery. Yeah, we I put, think that's the. I, I put that might have been the trigger to, to it. I don't know, or maybe just going in the cemetery too. So I tossed the stone, stone before I left. So that was another uh, story that involves mystical sound. Um, okay, so. We know we experience these things, and we also know that other people experience these kinds of things. But I think mainstream science still rejects the reality of psychic abilities. Precognition, seeing the future, psychokinesis, mind over matter, remote viewing, seeing a distance on the physical side. I mean, how many scientists consider these abilities as anything but imaginary and hardly worth looking into? So does that make us outliers? You asking me? Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, I guess by the very definition of the mystical underground, uh, to some, yeah, uh, <laughs> to some extent, it, it's about being uh, able to read the signs and symbols and uh, phenomena that manifest in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes it, it takes a while to figure out these uh, signs or what they mean, especially 
when they prove to be precognitive, something happening that's going to happen in the future. Remember that dog Megan sculpted? Uh, oh, yeah, third, back, grade. Like third grade. Third yeah. grade, um, It was around Thanksgiving, and everyone in Megan's class had to create a sculpture or a painting or drawing of what they were going to be grateful for. So families were invited to this final presentation, and uh, Rob and I were sitting at the back of the room, and Megan, Megan had sculpted a golden retriever out of wood, and she stood up, came to the front of the room, said she was grateful for the dog we were going to get. Well, this was news to Rob and me. Yeah, we looked at each other. Uh, we already had two cats and didn't have any intention of uh, getting a dog, although mentioned, Megan might have mentioned that she wanted a dog. But anyhow, two weeks later, the father of a friend of Megan's, who uh, was a security officer for the school district, said he had a golden retriever that had flunked out of the drug <laughs> sniffing program and needed a home and this dog was great she just didn't want to be a drug sniffer um anyway we brought jesse home with us to try her out and see how she get along with the cats and she stayed for 11 years yeah. precognition seeing the future that's how it worked with megan's sculpture but it can work in any anything with anything yeah so uh in 2005, there was a study conducted by Baylor University, and it discovered that just 15% of Americans believe in the paranormal. And then you compare that to a study that was just uh, a dozen years later at Chapman University called American Fears, that was the name of the study, it included a battery of items on uh, paranormal beliefs that uh, range from a belief in Bigfoot, uh, <laughs> to psychic powers and haunted houses, ancient civilizations like Atlantis, to uh, visits by aliens. And the findings, surprisingly, uh, the findings concluded that 75% of Americans believe in uh, some facet of the paranormal. And I guess, you know, the mystical underground is getting crowded compared to <laughs> <laughs> earlier. I mean, so generally, I mean, people, I think, have become more open to these experiences. So they have, have them more frequently. And more people are willing to talk about them. I mean, when Rob and I went, met in 1981, hardly anybody talked about this stuff, even if they did experience it. Um, so that's the theme that runs through phenomena, is that we all have these abilities and we experience these things. There's nothing spooky about them. Well, it can be spooky sometimes. Uh, we, we got spooked once in a town in central Florida, just north of Orlando, where phenomena is common. Casa Dega is a spiritualist community, and it seems like there nearly everyone talks to the dead. They're all mediums. Yeah, they're basically. all mediums or psychics. And on weekends, it's jammed with people from all over the country looking looking for a reading. And, uh, you know, almost every, so almost everyone there talks to spirits. I think there's about uh, maybe 125 people that live in this little town. They live in the camp, which it, is the, the, camp, the right. official. Yeah, uh, the, it was uh, founded in 1894 by George Colby after uh, a Native American spirit guide named Seneca directed him to journey from Lake Mills, Iowa, to the wild interiors of Central Florida, to that exact location. Um, so now this place has not changed much since I first went there in 1975. Yeah. A uh, friend of mine in graduate school said, "Hey." Let, let's go to Casa Dega and have a reading. And I said, where's Casa Dega? I'd never heard of it. She says, well, come on, I'll show you. So we went, and the camp looks almost the same now as it did in 1975 when I went. You walk around the camp, and almost everybody has a sign in their front yard that either says medium, reverend, astrologer, psychic, whatever it is. And there's a hotel there built, I think, in 1922, a Mediterranean-style hotel that's sort of the center place there. But uh, there, there's also other psychics and mediums that are not part of the Casa Dega uh, spiritualist camp. community. They're not <laughs> officials, and they live on the outside of the camp. And uh, so we have a, a— Which is across the street from the hotel. It's not like it's another yeah, settlement. Yeah, it's not like a, a distant place. Like, In fact, when you go to Casa Dega and you're at the front of the hotel, the most prominent house uh, is right across the street. 
And uh, a friend of ours lives there, Kathy Adams. She's a psychometrist. We're going to have her for an interview uh, coming up soon. And psychometrists, what they do, Kathy can hold any object that you've used. In fact, when Megan goes to her, she gives Kathy her cell phone and she reads energy. So that's how she works. We're going to have her on hopefully soon to talk about her work and what it's like. Okay. Imagine holding anything and you pick up something about it. You go to the grocery store. How, what, what kind of experience is that? Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, she can't be tuned in all the time, no. I would think. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're going to move right on to the writer's corner next. And uh, what do you say about the writer's corner, Trish? Well, you're the one who's got the amazing okay. piece on amazing. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, as professional writers of more than 100 books over 30 plus years, we've gathered quite a bit of knowledge about uh, the publishing industry and about the process of writing and also about the use of English language. And uh, so in this space, at the end of our uh, podcast, we're going to usually talk about something related to writing or uh, publishing or, or the English language. And today it's going to be we're going to talk about a particular word. Uh, <laughs> amazing. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's about the amazing overuse of a particular <laughs> word. And that word is amazing. Um, amazing by definition means overwhelming surprise or astonishment. So for a year or two, or probably longer, I've heard people overusing and improperly using that word. It's become kind of a handle for almost any situation imaginable. In fact, it's so overused that you uh, you hear someone around you say, that's amazing. And then maybe you hear that phrase on the radio or television within seconds. That's probably not amazing or a synchronicity. It's just <laughs> more overuse of the word pop up. So I was aware amazing was trending in our vocabulary and uh, it kind of blew away the word awesome. It used to Everything used <laughs> to be awesome. Then it became amazing. And uh, years ago, it was uh, groovy was the word okay. <laughs> back to the 60s. OK, so uh, one day a while back, I was playing disc golf, frisbee golf and I happened to find someone else lost disc I turned it over and saw a phone number and the name Alex on it so I texted Alex telling him that what I found where I found it a minute later I got a text back and he said the text had two words you're amazing but gee I don't even know this dude and I'm says I'm amazing <laughs> so you'd think that he really liked that disc and was excited about getting it back but that that wasn't it at all he a uh, second text came he said eh, just keep it you know, he didn't uh, he didn't care about it. So maybe he thought I was amazing for taking the effort to text him. So anyhow, <laughs> so even robots are overusing that word. I was playing words with friends and playing against the computer when I won a game in a kind of an easy version. And I was told that I was amazing. But really, it was just <laughs> that the computer was stupid on, on purpose and uh, that there was nothing amazing at all about my win. So yeah, I started uh, noticing the word more and more referring to things that, that really weren't amazing. Uh, this salad is amazing. Your eyebrows look amazing. <laughs> the lighting in this selfie is amazing. Now, those are examples that uh, were came from a, an article about amazing that uh, came out recently in the New York uh, Daily News. And it was headlined, Why Celebrities and Millennials Should Stop Using the Word Amazing. And the writer not only noted that amazing at uh, some point, had replaced uh, awesome, but also mentioned mentioned the word groovy from from the 60s. So the article reported that there also are there curmudgeons on the internet among us who write on a blog that's dedicated solely to complaining about the over. No, that's really of, kind of yeah silly. of the word. And I haven't found that, or I haven't <laughs> looked, or even looked for it. Uh, it's just that would just be more amazing stuff. So. Uh, and then anyhow, the writer ends uh, New York Daily News ends her piece by saying the truth is we should reserve amazing for truly um, astonishing moments. That would be groovy, awesome and amazing. <laughs> so finally, uh, no sooner had I read that uh, Daily News article and I got a group email online from a friend, Brandon, and he was promoting an acquaintance website and he wrote me. 
Her Native American artistry grows more amazing to me each time I go to her website to see uh, what her last, what her her, la- her latest creation. So I went to that app, uh, that website and took a look, and uh, it's quite unique and interesting. But I don't know if I would want to call it mind blowing, astonishing, or stunning, or amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so I I want to just include an example though of something that I thought. Really, really was amazing. Uh, yeah. So remember when President Obama broke out into song at a funeral and sang Amazing Grace? I, I thought that was surprising and quite amazing to see a president of the United States carrying a par- powerful tune, especially one that was written in 1779 at a, top, at a time when amazing was reserved for things that were truly amazing. <laughs> okay, we're going to make the mystical underground really amazing. <laughs> hopefully in the true sense of the word. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the February astrological forecast is available as star power. And it's, this is a forecast for February. And eventually, hopefully it'll be weekly. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining the Mystical Underground. Listen to the podcast at themysticalunderground.com. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Follow Trish and Rob on Instagram at Trish and Rob McGregor. Follow the podcast on Twitter at The Mystic Cast. Visit the blog, blog blog.synchrosecrets.com. Visit the book site, phenomenon111.com. Until next week, thank you for listening and stay mystical. An interesting piece of synchronicity. Uh, one of my, I've got three favorite bands that I, yeah. uh, and one of them is Pearl Jam. Okay. They've got a new album coming out uh, uh, in March. They released the first single this past week, and the name of the single is Dance of the Clairvoyance. Isn't right. that great? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, we have a friend uh, who uh, is going to be on later on. Uh, she and her husband used to be big, big fans deadheads. of uh, Deadheads. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they would travel all over the country following that band around. <laughs> Thing. Pearl Jam is <laughs> becoming the Grateful Dead of the 21st century. I have attended concerts everywhere from Oklahoma City to Milton Keynes, England. Jeez. Yeah, so. Well, who's the Jerry just, Garcia among them? Uh, that would be that would be Eddie Vedder. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now we know somebody out on the West Coast who is a big, big, big fan of Springsteen, and mm-hmm. uh, she, and her, she and her husband follow him around and have for years and then we blew them away by telling him, you know what he belongs to the gym in the winter that we go to you see him walking around yeah and i went up to him and i said said, can i interview you for my blog on synchronicity and he was so sweet he goes let me put on my shirt first and i said no don't (laughs) do not my friends want to see your biceps